All right, welcome everybody to the November 11th, 2022 edition of Legal Tech Week, the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and legal innovation. I am Bob Ambrogi. I have a blog called Law Sites and a podcast called Law Next and a legal tech directory also called Law Next. And uh, we're going straight to Joe because he's pro promised us a dramatic introduction today. So Joe, introduce yourself. Oh, fair. Uh, no, it's it's nothing. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm Joe. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. Uh, I am one of the great journalists of our time, according to Judge William Pryor of uh, of the Eleventh Circuit, who who decided to uh, say that in a long rambling uh, opening to the Federalist Society annual meeting. Oh, you were and part of so, that. Huh? Oh, I was name checked. Yeah, yeah. No, he told his uh, his fun little. Hitler Youth Rally uh, about me by name. So I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, he named me and uh, Ellie and Catherine, like a, the, a lot of the above the law folks. That's awesome. So are you like now on hit lists or something all over the world? Or uh... I'm sure I am. Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> you probably already were anyway, so that's kind of... I mean, that. yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> hey, it, you know, it's nice just to be recognized, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, in, okay. Um, and uh, well, that was <laughs> Stephanie. Uh, which which hit list are you on? Oh yeah, I got nothing to follow that. I'm just I'm Stephanie <laughs> Williams, editor in chief of Legal Tech News at ALM, and not on any hit list that I'm aware of yet. But we'll see. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Nikki Black. Uh, I'm Nikki Black. I am the I'm a lawyer and legal tech journalist and the director of SME and external education. In my case, I write legal tech columns for uh, Above Law, ABA Journal, and the Daily Record. And I also head up some reports and write them for the My Case side of things. And I'm just proud that I escaped the hell that is Newark Airport. I'll never fly in or out of there again. Five shuttles they sent me on to get to my stupid flight from Newark to Rochester, and I only needed to go on one. So I was just driving around in shuttles. So I am proud that I survived that this week and I'm back home safely. I do well, not work in Newark. That'll teach you to go to Newark. I know, right? You could have driven to Rochester <laughs> in that time. I know. So it was honestly like the trip from hell. And then they it was one of those ones where they take you out on a um thing, a uh, bus out to your plane. And once we were getting off the bus, I said, Do you think they're gonna make us load in forwarding zones? And everyone laughed. They're like, don't give many ideas. Like we're in the middle of a field getting on our on our plane it was the strangest thing never again it's afk from now on <laughs> all done. right so, sounds good and uh steve hi hey, steve embry i uh i'm a, also a practicing lawyer and write the blog tech law crossroads about legal innovation and legal technology and um uh, i may be on some hit list someplace somewhere but i don't know about it at least not yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah good you know, I had one of those. I had a week. I went one of those flights from hell this week too. Just I was coming back from Denver, where I went to the uh, Net Documents conference, uh, and uh, it it one of those flights is just like they get you out on the runway and you just like sit there forever waiting to take off, but nobody telling you why. Whatever. Finally, make it back to Boston at like two o'clock in the morning, and then the shuttle that I needed to get to get to my car, like an hour to get the stupid shuttle, and then they finally get to my car. So, not fun, but I. You know, did get to go to another Gaylord hotel this week, which was just really exciting. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Gaylord Rockies in Denver, after our experience at Clio and uh, Ilta, that's like three Gaylords in a year for me. So it's got to be some kind of a world record. Or something. Well, I, but, I think Thomson Reuters is having a, their their confab at the Gaylord in Washington. Is it next week? Well, well, I'm not going. Get invited to the if, if you want to make another contest. Gaylord. You, you, if you don't want to make another Gaylord this year, here's your opportunity. <laughs> they didn't invite me, Steve. They just invite the uh, big man. Well, they didn't there. invite me either, but. <laughs> okay. So was it as uh, I'm sprawling? used to it. <laughs> the, the, the Rockies Gaylord is actually relatively sane. Uh, it's smaller than the one in Nashville, but it's it's a work in progress. It's very new. And it's it's completely surrounded by construction where they're going to be building out all these water parks and all this stuff. So right now it's just all dirt around it, and it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's out by the airport in Denver. You can't, you're you're stuck in the. There's no absolutely nowhere to go outside of the hotel. So 
that's it. When you're there, you're there and uh, nothing else to do. But it wasn't horrible. You know what? Real quick, I'll jump in with a random thing that I learned this week. The Gaylord Nashville that we uh, went to for that show, uh, I did not know it was the hotel that was involved in a famous internet incident several in like 2012 or something like that, where they put up one of those first situations where there was a screen that people could just use the hashtag it would show up and it was it was one where one of the convention goers sent to one of the more aggressive reddit chains like disrupt this and it became a huge thing and like went viral as people were like putting the worst possible things on it so i i was watching some video of that happening and i was like oh i've been in that hotel anyway awesome so I so say we already got a question about the dot vine format. <laughs> it's it's really funny because I, I talked about this last week, and uh, I, my 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 post last week has been uh, uh, just through the roof. When I was at uh, at Net Documents, everybody people were like stopping me all over, saying, "What's going on with that dot vine format? And what's going on with file vine?" Everybody just wanted to talk about that. It's really funny. I finally got a demo yesterday of the dot file for, find, the dot vine format that I've been that I railed against in my prior post, and I haven't had a chance to write up my uh, my later my later response based on that demo. Um, but I, I will say that I, I do think that the biggest problem Filevine had was was overhyping something that uh, that isn't what the hype made it out to be. I mean, it's a really cool thing, and and it's going to be really cool for their customers. But when they kind of came out and said we're going to displace Microsoft Word and Google Docs and, and whatever else as the primary format for the legal market. Uh, I don't I don't think they really meant that. I, I think that's what the press release kind of said. Uh, and uh, it's really, you know, it's a document assembly format and it does some really cool things, but uh, it's not a full word processing format at this point and, and they're not putting it out there as one. Um, but I will uh, hopefully by Monday, I'll, I'll write something up on that. So in other news, since we were in our in our pre show here, we were all kind of railing about Twitter and Musk and Tesla's and, and other such things. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Nikki, you got a couple of stories this week uh, about guess who uh, Elon Musk and, and Twitter. Do uh, you want to talk about that? Well, it, it just struck me as the week moved along every single day. There was some just outrageous headline about Elon Musk and his latest Twitter decision and then taking back the decision or changing it. And, and now there's like people taking advantage of that gray check or the, I don't even know what check, the new check. You know, there's just constantly, there's something ridiculous happening in addition to lawsuits, potential, all sorts of things related to Elon Musk are just triggering potential lawsuits. You know, there, there is so much like likelihood of um, litigation coming from all the things that he's doing, not just related to Twitter. And so that's kind of what struck me was that, you know, one thing that I saw was that, that initially caught my eye was that Zoom is coming to your Tesla, which, you know, just seems self-driving car or not, <laughs> just seems like a recipe for a disaster. Um, and so, you know, and so I, you know, tweeted PI litigators, take note, you know, just jot that down for future reference. And, and then um, uh, there was a, uh, Catherine Rubino from Above the Law. I think she was the first place where I saw this, but it's since been posted. Um, and a lot, a lot of other people have covered this as well about the um, the lawsuits that are now uh, happening because of the mass layoffs that he's done, violating some state laws. I think uh, California in particular, which has a 60-day notice requirement in certain situations. And then what I found as I was getting ready for this uh, <clears throat> for today was a Reuters article that I'll post as well, but I just want to read some of the litigation that is related to things that he's done since the whole announcement that he's going to buy Twitter. There's the Twitter lawsuit itself. There's a $55 billion, uh, which is about investors suing him about um, actually purchasing Twitter, which he eventually did because he knew he was stuck. There's a $55 billion Tesla pay lawsuit. Um, which relates to his Tesla pay package, employment disputes relating to harassment that have nothing to do with the litigation surrounding the Twitter layoff. Um, 
There are lawsuits relating to his tweets all over the place that had to do with the Twitter purchase um, and also relating to Tesla. So all these things that he's pleading that are affecting shares and, um, and then uh, investigations of Tesla driver assistance. There have been 273 vehicle crashes since July, 2021 involving advanced driving assistance systems. So there are those issues. And then Solar City, Tesla investors are appealing a ruling about um, <clears throat> his, uh, something about guiding the company to acquire Tesla to acquire Solar City. And there's an SEC investigation pending. So those are just some of the many lawsuits that have been triggered by his behavior. And you know, there's gonna be a lot more to come because of all the absurdity of the last week. So he's keeping us in business. So that's why I wanted to, you know, <laughs> that. So, you're saying it was a, Although, so, you're, so you're saying it was a really good time for him to fire all his lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, By the way, Gene has joined us. Hi, Gene. Gene joined us. Hey. Sorry about that. I will have to say, Nikki, about the about the Zoom calls from Tesla. I mean, there I, I will have to confess, I own a Tesla, and I have, I have done some calls sitting parked with a Tesla Zoom calls on a phone or laptop. But I've often sort of looked at that very nice screen that kind of sits in the middle of the console, and thinking, boy, it would really be nice if. I could have the Zoom call on that screen, um, but I guess, alas, that that will never happen. <laughs> well, no, because in solidarity a... with the workers, you're getting rid of your Tesla, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I will. I will have to say I, I enjoyed the Tesla quite quite a lot when gas prices hit about five dollars a gallon. That that, that was kind of yeah. nice. <laughs> So on the on the subject of this legal thing and uh, the, the Tesla uh, Twitter issues and legal advice, uh, Alex Spiros, who I've talked to in the past and, uh, you know, is an interesting uh, lawyer, he uh, he appears to be the only lawyer still working with Elon, as far as anyone can tell. And rumors are that he's saying of the FTC issue because they're under an FTC consent decree still. And that says that they're supposed to check with the FTC before unveiling new products and stuff, which obviously he's done and reversed like 10 times this week. Uh, and they, apparently Spiro is saying like, ah, he's not worried about the FTC. And I'm like, at what point does this start pushing toward, you know, problems for him as a lawyer? Because I don't <laughs> think you're supposed to be saying, ah, eh, we're not worried about the government. <laughs> Well, and somebody else didn't somebody else also say that about the Warren Act stuff. I mean, it's yeah. it's not it's not actually clear. I, I'm actually not even entirely clear on whether he did violate the the Warren Act. I, I saw I mean I saw an interview with the Shannon Liz Reardon, who's the uh, Boston uh, class action attorney who's suing him, brought brought the suit against him. And I, I I thought she said something about the fact that by offering by if he keeps everybody on the payroll through January, uh, even though he didn't give proper notice now of the layoffs that somehow that might exempt him or or save him under the warn act issue but or just I, mean I that there's totally... no yeah that there's no injury if he has a severance that's long enough to cover it maybe something like that something like that yeah, yeah. but I, I don't i don't know enough about the war i don't know anything about the warn act so i don't know whether that's in fact the case but hmm. all right and uh, are we all still on Twitter or are we waiting? Are we like waiting to see if who's going to drop off? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, whoever will, buys I will it next. Chime in. I, will I want chime to know who in, got but... a blue check. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've always had one. So I no one has now, told me I don't. No one's charged me yet. So I'm still sticking with it. it. Yeah, You'll they have haven't. Pay for it now. They haven't sent me a bill or anything. See, that's the thing. They haven't sent me a bill or anything. And the way he keeps saying, oh, we're going to get rid of them. Oh, we're going to keep them. Oh, we're going to create a new gray check mark. Oh, well, we're going to get rid of that. Like, I, by the time it comes around, maybe the whole policy will have changed. I don't know. I thought, didn't, wasn't the latest thing that he had abandoned the charging for it? I can't even keep up. Yeah, like, it, 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 he changes every, every few hours because he has no idea what he's doing. Well, and it went from $20 to $8 to... Now we're going to have a different check mark to maybe only one check mark or none. Like it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, then he killed he killed that check mark, and then he said everyone gets a blue, but if you click on it, it will determine whether it's because you're really verified or because you're paying. However, I they that. 
have screwed that up and a bunch of people who have paid are clearly being registered shown as though they're really verified which is why tesla has an, a verified account up right now that is just roasting elon for five hours and they're unable to stop it <laughs> because he's fired all the people whose job it is to kill kill accounts so it's you all think maybe yeah. it's one of them yeah well or maybe it's real yeah good point <laughs> Well, he did say he well, did send you the bill, by to... the way, but it's in your direct messages, which nobody ever reads. <laughs> I, I do a lot in my DMs, actually. Like I, 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 it's I wouldn't see it if somebody sent it on LinkedIn. That's how I would never see it. Exactly. That's just exactly. a black exactly. hole of messages. Yeah. Right. There uh, was apparently will, a really we'll funny to... story <clears throat> that happened relating to the check marks, where some eighteen-year-old in college, cre- and I know nothing, I don't follow football, but created an account pretending to be a some famous coach that everyone knows and started tweeting outrageous things about football and because it was a verified account that had that said that the coach's name, but then they had not after it, but no one saw the not because his actual name was his handle had the word not, but the name on the account didn't. And so the news started picking it up and there was like all this traction and he was saying the most outrageous things about football. None of it struck me as outrageous because I didn't know about, I had no idea who the people were, but apparently everyone else that understands football thought it was outrageous and were, they were retweeting them because they were just unbelievable stories. And they were not true. <laughs> That's what it turned out to be. I got a I kick out of it. Apparently, apparently, some of the people that are that are tweeting about Elon have, have taken to call him El Elno. <laughs> Elno, so they won't be they won't be caught in the Elon Twitter trap and have retribution. But uh, there was an article in the New York Times today, and it was it summarized the debt that's been um, created. And it was thirteen billion dollars in debt for the buyout that the Twitter company has been saddled with, and that's one billion in interest every year. Uh, and Twitter has lost money for eight of the past ten years. So uh, things things do not look good, even even if Elno did know what he was doing when he bought the company. Yeah, well, even even Jack Dorsey said Twitter was a little too too fat uh, uh, on the payroll side, and uh, yeah. So. Uh, well, Jean, we haven't heard from you for a while. What's going on? What's new with you? Uh, well, I, I guess I, I was recapping. My, my suggestion was to recap a, a program I was on a couple of uh, back in September. And, and I think it's timely because I, and many, many firms are doing their budgets now. And so I had been on a panel where uh, we were recapping what I had done a survey and people were responding to what are the worst vendor practices and so, uh, you know, some of them are, you know, bundling, uh, you know, lots of the vendors have gotten rid of some of their support teams. So you're sort of on your own. People send out, bo- you know, very complicated um, billing. In fact, I had one situation just this week where a vendor had always said quarterly bills. And all of a sudden I had a massive bill that came in at the end of the year and uh, it caught people's eyes, believe it or not. Um and one of the things we always complain about is that vendors don't provide user statistics. So, you know, all of these things help with people who are mad- managing content want to be able to um, control, you know, d- do ROI analysis so they can understand what should I buy next year? What what products are underperforming? What are overperforming? Or what should we keep? What should we get rid of? And one other thing that came up during the uh, the, oh, and then the last thing I want to say was that vendors are using the recession as an excuse to insert cost of living escalation clauses so that you will pay, even if you have a multi-year flat fee contract, it's not no longer going to be flat. You're going to have escalation clauses on top of your uh, what was supposed to be a predictable cost, which I think is ridiculous because that completely undermines, you know, a, as a law firm. You're, you're entering into a bargain to get something for a certain fixed there. You're guaranteeing the company revenue for several years and they shouldn't come back and say, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to take away the, the value of that bargain to you. We're going to add on additional unforeseeable costs. So that's one of the challenges we're seeing as we go into the recession. And the last thing I wanted to say was the we did sort of a pop survey. There were about uh, almost 90 people on this uh presentation and uh, Thompson Reuters had just announced precision the day before. And so we asked the attendees if they, how soon they plan to get precision and only uh, 
fewer than 10% plan to get it within the next year. Uh, about 50% said late, you know, if, after 2024. So I think in terms of Thompson's timing for the rollout, rolling a, a an expensive new product out right at the beginning of a recession is problematic. Now, the only vendor I've known to overcome that was, and I don't know, does anybody remember what major product rolled out at the beginning of the last recession? And it was wildly successful. I'll give you a hint. It's a news product. <laughs> the end of the last recession, Law 360. Yep. They, I mean, it was a recession. They, and they, it took off like wildfire. They weren't cheap. So, I mean, that, that is, the, that is the only contrarian product that I've seen, go, you know, take off during a recession. So. Yeah. It took them a little while. That took them a little while though, didn't it? Did it take off quickly right away? They, yeah. they continued to grow steadily despite the, the, the recession. Yeah. So uh, one thing I thought was interesting, I mean, your survey, uh, I think because this is the first time you did it in a couple of years, you kind of talked about a span of a couple of years of uh, asking asking uh, information professionals about what what practices they wanted, you know, they didn't like that vendors were doing. Uh, and I, I thought the interesting one was the one about the force majeure, about the fact that when, when suddenly everybody, nobody's in the office anymore and people want, you know, they're all getting, they're ramping up their digital subscriptions, but they've still got some paper subscriptions or print subscriptions, the vendor said, sorry, we're going to keep yeah. sending you the print subscriptions. Yeah, it's a, it, it was, it enraged a lot of people. And unfortunately people have contracts that even though now everyone has pretty much all of the, almost a hundred percent of lawyers have been totally converted to doing digital research. If you have a contract that you signed years ago that goes out four or five years, you're going to have to have the print for another two years, even though you have no space for it. So it it's a real challenge. I was I was kind of surprised to even be thinking of law firms even getting print subscriptions anymore. But I guess that's still a thing. Huh? <laughs> well, if you, it sounds like they I, have to. <laughs> yeah, I I I was an early canceller, so I I have not had that issue. But a lot of firms where you have older partners who are insisting on keeping print, people did allow themselves to to maintain print up to the beginning of the, the recession, and so they were stuck and. And both of the largest vendors had called the, had created fixed fee pricing, so you got again predictable pricing, but you you were committed to it for five for five or six years. So that that became a real problem during the pandemic. I remember you know, when I used the, to be. Um, uh, yeah. No, oh, I was just going to say that the um, uh, somebody on Twitter this week made a point that uh, a, a I don't even think an old lawyer a you know, mid mid range partner lawyer made a made a comment about how they had to explain what a pocket part was to someone. And it was like the it was the moment that they felt like they should just be put out on an ice floe. Yeah, well, and speaking of old lawyers, I was just remembering how I, I used to practice Thanks, labor law. No, <laughs> no I, wasn't about about lawyers. I wasn't talking about you, Steve. But uh, talking about myself, I used to practice labor law. I remember I used to get these the BNA binder. They're like they were like three ring binders, yeah. and you get these things in the mail. It'd be like, take out page twenty six through twenty seven, and stick in new page twenty six right. through twenty seven A B or something. And and you have this like it would take like hours. And of course, then nobody would ever do it, so they'd all just pile up on a shelf somewhere. And, and then when you actually had to research something that was current, you'd have to like go through all these old things that were piled up on your shelf somewhere that you would never insert it into the three ring binder. Yeah, well, you've just highlighted. We've come a like, long way. <laughs> the, I mean, actually, that was a, that was dramatically valuable way to update back in 1930. And you know, ever since ever since the world went digital, it has been absurd that people wanted to have. Out, you know, when you think of the the publication process. Everything you're inserting into a book in 2022 is a month old. So it's like, what is the point? <laughs> right. Well, and that's right. causing me some flashback trauma because when I was in college, I interned in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in New York in, Rock in Syracuse. And that was my job was to just basically, I hung around with the law students, but most of what I did was just 
add those inserts into all the books all day long. It was awful. So thanks for that flashback. Well, I, I did that too. I, I mean, I also want to say that like in the early 90s, I had gone on a tear to get rid of uh, Shepherds, the, the Shepherds books, because that, that is a product that was born to be digital. I mean, that, that, that was never easy to do. And, you know, like I almost lost my job because the, the managing partner couldn't imagine um, were practicing law and trusting digital updating on, on, on case citations. So we've come a long way. I don't think any, nobody argues that they want to bring those books back. Greg, Greg Lammer says the only reason to keep print is when the print is $300 and the online is $3,000, which happens when vendors do firm wide pricing. So yeah, I guess that's an issue. Uh, all right. Um, we actually have Joe and Stephanie have sort of related picks on uh, at least one of your stories, Stephanie, this week. It's fla flashback to Relativity Fest. You thought we'd heard all about Relativity Fest, but more Relativity Fest or more Relativity stuff. Oh yeah, um, I saw I saw Joe threw that in, so I threw mine in second. So Joe can yeah. go ahead. All right, well then we can start with Joe's first and, and then your second. Okay, Joe. well, uh, my, mine actually, uh, Bob, you also were there. We did the we did an interview together where we were chatting with- but You actually wrote about it and I haven't done that yet, so. Fair enough, yeah, okay, yeah. And so we, we met with uh, the folks from, uh, from the Justice for Change initiative that Relativity does. Um, which is kind of a, it's an, it's an awesome little program. Uh, look, we, we talk a lot about public service and access to justice and whatever, uh, and that made it, that sounded bad and whatever, but uh, we talk about those, those themes a lot. Uh, and this is an instance where a company is actually doing something about it, uh, relativity, obviously important in e-discovery, but also can be used to process a lot of data and get some insights all over the place. We chatted with uh, their folks about some of the stuff they do. Uh, in particular, we talked to, to the folks from the Georgia Innocence Project who utilize this program and use Relativity to process tons of files that are out there to see if there's any case that they can go get. Uh, and one of the themes that I thought was interesting from it was, you know, they almost seemed a little apologetic about it that like, oh, you know, we can't really point to, hey, this program has won us this case, you know, it, it has won us this exoneration. And, but, you know, they, it, like it, it really was one of those situations where I think that might be what they have to say to non-lawyers, uh, but to those of us who are lawyers, uh, it, it, it it was clear that that didn't matter. A lot of what was going on was processing tons of old, often handwritten files uh, to gather data. And one of the things that the uh, initiative has managed to find is that there's a county in Georgia that has a suspicious number of convictions that all tie to a you know a handful of the same individuals in law enforcement that seems fishy and they're now digging into that and that's the kind of insight that you can get when you run thousands and thousands of documents through a thing and have ai find your uh find your patterns you know and that's that's valuable in and of itself uh even if it doesn't result in any uh exonerations it's at least a good watchdog to have well yeah, i thought really that was yeah go ahead Oh, I was going to say that's a really interesting use case because um, when I spoke at the <clears throat> New York City Solo and Small Firm Symposium earlier this week, afterwards a guy came up to me who and asked for my advice on software. And I actually mentioned relativity because I thought that it did what he wanted, which was he represented, um, it was a public interest group really that um, advocated for people who were being unjustly convicted. And they wanted to sort through all the data and find patterns in pockets of where that was actually happening. And I recommended that he consider relativity because I thought that it might do what he wanted. So it's helpful to hear that. I think I sent him in the right direction and hopefully it can do what they want at a price they can afford because it is public interest. So we'll see, but that's a cool use case. Yeah, Stephanie, I know you guys, you, you wrote after, about about a little bit about this broader justice for change uh, initiative that, that that's part of. Uh, yeah. Saying, yeah, I sat down with two other, they have a number of uh, Justice for Change partners. So I sat down with a couple other ones. It was um, Matthew Golab from Gilbert and Tobin in Australia. And then um, 
uh, Everest discovery, or, yeah, Everest um, here and just about the different sorts of projects they do and the whole idea that they use, they get to use this discovery, all these tools from relativity for free to sort of like they were even describing it's a lot of like David versus Goliath and they get to do all this work for these people, which they almost feel like it's not a big deal to them because in compared to the giant cases they usually handle, it's not that much, but to the people they're helping, it's astronomical. And on the pattern recognition, I had written before too about the whole, that was the subject of their documentary this time about how they use the pattern recognition to fight human trafficking. So it was just really remarkable to me. And I think Bob and I, you and I were saying this last week too, that how little they used the word e-discovery at the conference. And there was so much focus on all this social justice stuff, which I think is great. Yeah, and uh, actually your mention of Everest just reminds me that it's also, not only is it relativity kind of contributing use of its product and and, and store server space and that sort of thing, but it's partners uh, who are, you know, consultants around using the relativity tools are also volunteering their time and donating right. their time. So that like, like when you have a, 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 a project like the Georgia Innocence Project, you get actual e-discovery experts helping you use these tools and, and figure out how to use them. So I, you know, good for them all for, for doing it and doing it for free. Uh, and uh, there, I think you can just, anybody listening who's interested can go to their website. There's a, there's a uh, part of their relativities website that where people can apply uh, to be part of this program and uh, a yeah. number of, a number of opportunities. Yeah. And it's not only law firms. Like I sat down with um, Matthew Golab from a law firm and then Dennis Roberts from, from Everest in the same conversation. The three of us just had to talk about it. And, you know, one's a vendor and one's a law firm. And it's really, they're open to anyone being these partners. They just, Relativity gets the cases and they sort of vet them first. I guess you could go to Relativity with your case too. But um, yeah, they have a whole program with lots of opportunities for various people in the legal services range of you know, range of like organizations to help out with. Yeah, I wonder if anybody organizes all these opportunities because there are various legal tech companies that do have these sort of, you know, free offers for social justice organizations or or that sort of thing. Uh, this is not unique. I mean, it's it's a great one that Relativity is doing and an expansive one, but there are other things out there like that. I, and I don't know of any one place that kind of brings those all together and makes them easy to find. That might be a good thing to do. Uh, maybe my directory, I should do that in my directory. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna say, this seems like a job for a directory of some yeah, kind. Yeah, I was. It that's does. exactly what I was saying. Attitude. Wait, 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 oh, oh wait. No Did, good deed goes unrewarded, no, right? Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 we, we're forgetting. The king of the natural segue, just like passive aggressively segued himself into selling his directory. Well done. <laughs> like we didn't even see it coming. Oh, nice. There you go. All right. Yeah. yeah. So I've been so I've since the, I'm so sensitive to Bob's segues that when he, he said, speaking of older lawyers, I immediately thought he was going to segue <laughs> to me. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, and no, and I, that was not an intentional segue to my directory. But um, uh, so, uh, well, Stephanie, while, while we got you, there was a, did you want, you've got another interesting story to speak. Do you want to talk about the other one? Oh yeah, that was the other one I was going to be. I was hoping Carolyn would be here because it's a UK story. Um, it's a couple, it's from a couple of weeks ago, but apparently she's out drinking. We know it's yes, Friday. Night. She's out drinking. True. <laughs> apparently, the you know, like the case Are you management libeled in the UK. Yeah, the case management system they put in place in the UK courts is so bad that it caused like a nine-day strike of sixty-eight case, case workers across the UK and Wales. And so I just thought that was fascinating that, I mean, legal tech could be at the source of a strike, but then it also raises the bigger question, not just in the courts. If you invest all this money on, in a technology and it turns out to be bad, what do you do? Do you have to double down on it and force your workers to use it that they hate it so much that they strike? Or are we, what do you do at that point with the sunk costs? Well, I don't know what you do at that point, but what you do before you even get to that point, and what I always recommend to lawyers and law firms is, you have all the stakeholders get buy-in ahead of time, test it out, try it out, make sure they like it. Don't just have someone from IT or some managing partner who's on a committee try it. Make sure that everybody in the firm who's going to be using that software tests it out ahead of time because then you're going to get buy-in and it's going to be a lot easier to implement it and train them because they had they participated in that process. It sounds like 
they absolutely didn't do that by the results, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's more than just buy-in. I mean, you know, a lot of the vendors don't don't really focus on the end users when they're when they're marketing their products, and that's a huge mistake because as it shows, I mean, if the end users can't use the product, it doesn't do what they need to have done. It's it's going to be a failure, and it could be a colossal failure, as this example demonstrates. And an expensive one, right? Yeah. What a waste of money and time and energy. It seems I was waiting to see if uh, I know Jim McMillan is in the audience, or he was. And- the National Center of State Courts, uh, whether he weighs in on this. But I mean, it did seem to me for for a while and maybe a little bit more, a little earlier in the days of courts sort of rolling out a lot of this uh, new technology that they, they were particularly bad <laughs> at the at the process of, of, of putting out RFPs and, and picking the right technology. Uh, and I, th- I think thing, obviously as, as they've kind of come to center on a few principal vendors, at least in the United States, that's that's not so much the case. But I, I don't know whether it was that that courts are, were, were were bad at it or that they're just you know the results of their purchases are so much more public because uh, they're they're putting out uh, you know uh, public facing interfaces uh, for for filing and accessing dockets and all of that uh, and so we're all seeing uh, the the uh, results of those buying decisions more transparently. You know- it also makes me wonder to what extent they looked at the the end user experience because I think of Pacer and how no matter how much they change that change Pacer, it it seems to get more complicated all the time. The technology doesn't seem to be making the user experience any better. That's one yeah. of the biggest challenges with UI and software is when companies first <clears throat> start off as startups. They're not the product's not that robust, right? Because they're you know rolling out the basic product, and at that point, it's usually it should be ideally simple, simple and easy to use because there aren't that many features. And the biggest challenge is as you add features, make the software more robust. How do you stay true to that initial user, uh, intuitive user interface? And that's like something like Nicole Braddock I think talks about a lot. But you know, there's it's super challenging. And Pacer, you know, is now a mature product for lack of a better word that was not beautiful to begin with. And so as it starts trying to stay up with the times and add new features and functionality, I can understand why it just has ended up being really challenging. And on the court front, we've been trying to, by we, I mean, some of our reporters, we've been trying to do some articles on court technology and it's still kind of like the wild west out there. There's nobody, even the ones that, I mean, you have a judge Schlegel who is a really an outlier who's being like, really progressive in the use of technology, but otherwise it's hard to find even anyone that can give any sort of answer to how it's being implemented or what rhyme or reason is being used. Probably also because our court system is so all over the board, you know. It's like the wild, wild west because the court system is, court systems, even particular courts within a given jurisdiction like family court or commercial court at the Supreme Court level in New York State, which is the trial level, you know, even those implement different systems. And so that's why I wrote that e-filing article for the ABA Journal, because there's services popping up to help lawyers with e-filing, because e-filing is different sometimes from court to court, even within the same jurisdiction. And it's so challenging and no one wants to miss a deadline because they screwed it up. So there's services that do this specifically so that lawyers don't have to worry about it and they can outsource it. And that's simply because there's there's no universal standard or no universal interface. It's and the ones that are there are horrible. They're like from the 1990s. They're really bad. Yeah, and somebody mentioned politics because obviously the politics plays a, a role in the funding and God knows all the other issues. I mean, I've also heard that in smaller courts, there's also a desire to protect the the lawyers in the local jurisdiction, and they don't really want to make it easy for outsiders to interact with the court. It's too bad Dan O'Day isn't on the, he's often in here and he runs ECFX. He has lots of experience dealing with individual courts. Well, you know, a lot of it is a funding issue too, because the courts don't have, they, they don't, they have to rely upon themselves for, because the funding is not there to do it sort of on a unified basis. So you have people like Joe Shagel who he'll run out and do it, but he's just a like a one man band, so to speak. So. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, Jim McMullen did make the point that uh, often these court systems are have to go through sort of standard government procurement operations, right. which are not uh, 
particularly sensitive probably to some of the issues that the courts face uh, or some of the user issues uh, involved there. So that's another problem, but. I, you know, at one point I was actually looking to see if there was an overarching state judicial organization or like a, a national state court clerks organization to see if they were working on, you know, like a uniform court filing and retrieval and search, uh, you know, recommendation. But I don't think anything like that has gotten started. It was the National Center for State Courts which is where Jim works. But I don't, I don't think they have any nationwide initiatives about standardizing technology. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there are though, again, I don't, this is something I don't know a lot, Jim, Jim would know, but there is this conference coming up. But there, there, I mean, there are, they, there are a couple, what, what's it, is it Tyler Technologies is becoming a, one of the dominant players in, in mm -hmm. a lot of state court systems. And there's one other big one that's sort of becoming, it's kind of like a, two or three uh, major players in that space that are becoming the dominant uh, provider. So to that extent, it starts to be, I mean, it doesn't mean standardization, but it, it moves us a step in that direction. But that's why, that's why, as you say, for companies like ECFX, for, you know, Pacer Pro, any of those other companies that are trying to get state court dockets in, or even Lex Machina or whatever, it's such a challenge to, to do that because the data is all over the place in all sorts of different formats and, and uh, the way they distribute court notices and filings and all of that is, is different from court to court to court. And it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah. And not necessarily even tagged at all. I mean, lots of things they're <laughs> not, <laughs> you'd have to get the T PDF and, and read it and tag it yourself, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Why don't we move on to Steve, to the, uh, Speaking young, of the, the young guy on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I put in the stories, doesn't really have much to do with with legal technology, but it, it was kind of interesting. Us. Buford Capital did a, did a study there. Buford Capital is a litigation funder, funding company, and they did a survey of, uh, of their business in-house uh, business counsel, in-house counsel that work for businesses about whether how aggressive they were in pursuing recoveries by being being plaintiffs in cases, particularly in business cases. And somewhat remarkably, but maybe not remarkably, the, the survey showed that about half of the in-house counsel they surveyed don't really pursue recoveries, which is really leaving lots of money on the table. Um, and um, when they were asked, well, who do you who do you look to 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 determine whether you might be able to pursue a recovery, they they would say, well, we look to our typical law firms, which, of course, are business defense oriented law firms. And so I, I, I was sort of sort of thinking about why half of the in-house counsel don't be more aggressive. And I think, you know, a lot of it is they rely upon defense law firms where most of those firms bill by the hour. Right. And when you're talking about recovery actions, you know, less is more. Um, if you bill by the hour, every hour you bill lowers the amount of the recovery and you could pretty, pretty quickly get underwater by lawyers that aren't used to be thinking, okay, how can I get this done really, really quickly? Because by getting it done really, really quickly, I will, I will create a higher recovery. And that's the contingency fee model, right? Where, where, where the lawyer actually has a stake in that and can, can get that recovery. And so, you know, I think a lot of it is just sort of this this um, lack of understanding and culture about recovery sort of actions, because most in-house counsel do come from defense firms, or or if they don't come from defense firms, that's who they are exposed to primarily. So they they have that mindset, and it's also a different, completely the mind, the strategic mindset is different. Um, you know, the first thing that a plaintiff's lawyer wants to do, right, is is get a trial date. Because you get a trial date, you now have an ending point that when the case has to be resolved by. But if you're a defense lawyer, and, and I, when I was practicing law full time, I, I did both on occasion. And a you know, defense lawyer is like, oh, what do I want a trial date for? <laughs> and we can wait forever, right? We've got we're holding on to the money, so why do we want to be in any hurry to get this resolved? So, uh, and the final thing that I know that I came up with, and I'd appreciate everybody else's thought was, you know, the, there are not a whole lot of really business oriented plaintiffs contingency fee law firms. There are some, but by and large, you're either a defense lawyer or you're a personal injury kind of 
contingency fee lawyer. And if you're an in-house counsel, who do you hate the most in the world? Most of the time, it's plaintiff's lawyers, right? So you say, well, all right, we're going to hire a plaintiff's lawyer. No, not getting into bed with those guys. You're out of your mind. They're, they're scum. Look at all the stuff that they do to us. So um, so I can sort of conclude with the, with, with the notion that if you, if you look at insurance companies, there is a reason that insurance companies have a claims department and a subrogation department, and they're completely different people, and they're completely different lawyers. And I think that is because it takes such a different mindset. So I, I just was kind of intrigued by this whole notion that so many in-house counsel just say we're, we're just not getting into that. Uh, it's just 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 not who we are, kind of thing. <laughs> I, I I I know nothing about that world, uh, but so. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me, though, of something that I I did hear a lot about uh, over my I was you know an officer of the Mass Bar Foundation for many years. We give out a lot of money to support legal services and other kinds of programs in the state. And uh, I know from time to time you'd hear of organizations that would bring public interest litigation of one kind or another, where there is an entitlement to attorneys' fees. Uh, and where they're successful, but then they don't go after the attorney's fees because they're they're sort of happy with the funding that's paying their bills to, to keep them going and do the kind of work they're doing. Uh, and they're not always kind of thinking about other ways that they can be recovering uh, some of the the, the, the costs of, of, of those litigation actions. Uh, and I know that uh, I had heard over the years various times where funding agencies would kind of put pressure on not pr pr pressure, but sort of give reminders <laughs> to some agencies they'd funded of the uh, to go after those opportunities for recovering attorneys fees, because of course, that's less money that that uh, then foundation funders need to give them or, or whatever else if they can recover some of that. So I don't know if that's quite parallel. But uh, I think I wonder how many times is sort of money getting left on the table in a sense uh, there that could be recovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lot. And, you know, I the same. I, well, if we have time, I will tell a quick law story. I put this in my post, but when I was, a, a I guess, a kind of a middle-aged lawyer, I was working, defending an insurance company or defending insurance of an insurance company in a, in a kind of a repetitive sort of situation across the country. And we had occasion to have to go meet with the head of subrogation who was thinking about, hey, can I recover some of these losses that I've been paying out? And when we walked in, we were in the waiting area, and there was this nice big picture of, of a lawyer named Steve Cozen, with, who founded Cozen and O'Connor, a very big subrogation firm. And it was a nice autographed picture. And I, I looked at that, and I asked my claims guy, I said, how come Steve Cozen gets his picture on the wall, and you don't put my picture on the wall? <laughs> the claims guy said, that's because he gets us money. You just cost us money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, well, I guess the, the only other story I'll uh, mention this week that I wrote about was, uh, as I said, I was at the Net Documents Conference, their Inspire Conference, uh, which was uh, kind of lonely. None of you guys were there. I think I was the only one. I was the only press at this conference. Uh, I had to just drink alone in my room the whole time. But uh, <laughs> now there, were, I found people to drink it. But um, it's it's it really it was actually a really good conference. It's very small, a lot fewer than four hundred people there. Uh, and like Relativity Fest, very much a user conference, you know, very much focused on net documents. Uh, and, you know, and another kind of parallel to Relativity uh, is that, you know, net documents is really trying to position itself, not just trying, very successfully positioning itself as a platform uh, and uh, as a platform on which you can do a whole range of uh, activities related to uh, documents. So it's not just a, even though they started out as a document management system, they're not just a, a sort of static repository of documents, but they are uh, uh, a very dynamic uh, workflow platform. Uh, they they talked a whole lot about their uh, acquisition of, uh, of after pattern and their rollout uh, earlier this year, just last month, I guess it was, of pattern builder, which is their sort of document assembly software. I, I know a number of us uh, were at that briefing when they rolled that out. Um, but talking a lot about how that's really just kind of the first steps of how they're going to be able to use some of that pattern builder technology, not just to create 
documents, but to really kind of automate all sorts of workflows uh, in legal organizations and, and law firms. Uh, so they've got some really ambitious and interesting plans, and I, I hope to uh, hope to get the chance to write up more about what I what I heard there. But uh, for for me and for I think a lot of people there, the kind of the big news was the uh, announcement uh, of the retirement of uh, Alvin Tejamulia, who was one of the three original co-founders of this company and and the last one still with the company, uh, and uh, who was. Uh, a 40 year veteran of, of legal technology, not, not just a veteran, but he, you know, originally he and the other co-founders that originally created a company called Soft Solutions, which was really the first document management product for uh, for the legal profession way back when. And then they got acquired by WordPerfect and then WordPerfect got acquired by Novell and uh, they didn't necessarily want to be there anymore. So they went off and started Net Documents in 1999. Uh, and, you know, remarkably for 1999, they started it as a cloud product. It was one of the first cloud products for legal. And, uh, you know, they talk to Alvin, and he'll tell you that uh, it was a, it was a tough sell in those early days to get uh, any lawyers to trust, you know, a, a platform in the cloud, a browser based platform in the cloud. It's also one of the first browser based uh, applications in, in legal. Uh, so, you know, it was uh, it was really, uh, really a, a, a trail. Tejabulia and, and his other founders were really trailblazers. Uh, and he's also I don't know if you guys have met him at all, but he's also just like the funniest guy and, and super smart and just super nice and kind and thoughtful. Uh, and he his he always would close off these these net documents conferences with his his uh, closing keynote at which he would. Uh, always you weave some intricate story that involved uh, some kind of wildlife or something and, and bring it all back to legal technology somehow. Uh, and uh, so uh, at the at the close of his keynote uh, this time he announced his uh, retirement. Uh, I had had a had a heads up only because the day before I sat down to record a podcast with with him and Josh Baxter, the CEO, and just as I'm about to hit the record button, they said, I think there's something we should tell you. <laughs> And uh, they said, tomorrow we're going to be announcing his retirement, so you may want to talk about, ask us about that. Oh, great. Um, but um, anyway, it was, it was really interesting. And, uh, you know, one of the few times I'm sitting there in this audience at this keynote, you're looking around and people were like crying uh, in the audience. He's just really a well-liked guy. So uh, it was, it was a, quite, a, quite an experience. Uh, anyway. All right. Anything else good of the order? Well, I, else I think to I think his I think his company. I mean, I, I've always thought very highly of NetDocs, and I think a lot of it was because he was sort of the soul of the company in a lot of ways. And uh, I was shocked when I saw that announcement. Actually, I mean, it's just one of those things you think it go on forever, I guess, because he was such personality and such a person of stature in the field. So. Uh, so yeah, he will he will certainly be missed, I think. Yeah, and he's going to retain a um, uh, a title. Uh, well, actually, he's going to be uh, he's taking over Nikki's old title, chief evangelist or something like that for the for the uh, company. So now that now that Nikki's title was up up for grabs, uh, her former title, uh, I think he grabbed it and saw saw his opportunity to retire and grab that title. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and yes, to whoever asked that, Ken Duncan was his partner, and uh, Ken retired uh, 2018, uh, and uh, Ken Duncan's brother uh, was the other founder. I forget, I forget his name, blank on his name, but uh, yeah, Ken was the CEO until 2018. Is it Lee? Because somebody else said Lee. Lee. So Lee and Ken, right, were the two brothers. Um, and then, uh, so... I should have pretended I just knew instead of referencing the comments. I would have seemed so smart. I know it. You would have, or I could have, yeah, if I had time, I would have read my own blog post, which is it's in there somewhere. But uh, anyway, all right. Well, if there's nothing else, we can go off to our weekends and uh, see you all back here next Friday. Same time, same place. Have a great weekend, have a good weekend everyone. everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.